Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. American astronaut Neil Armstrong, a devout Christian, visited Israel after his trip to the moon. He was taken on a tour of the old city of Jerusalem by Israeli archaeologist Meir Bendov. When they got to the Holda Gate, which is at the top of the stairs leading to the Temple Mount, Armstrong asked Bendov whether Jesus had stepped anywhere around there. I told him, look, Jesus was a Jew, recalled Bendov. These are the steps that lead to the temple, so he must have walked here many times. Armstrong then asked if these were the original steps, and Bendov confirmed that they were. So Jesus stepped right here, asked Armstrong. That's right, answered Bendov. I have to tell you, Armstrong said to the Israeli archaeologists, I am more excited stepping on these stones than I was stepping on the moon. It's amazing to think that God took on flesh and came to this earth to die for sinners. It is easy to understand Neil Armstrong's excitement to walk where Christ did in Jerusalem. The places, cities, and geography all over Israel line up exactly with the description and teachings of the Bible. And this is especially true in Jerusalem. All this demonstrates why you can trust the Bible. Luke 22, 39 to 44 reads, And he came out and went, as he wont, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The Garden of Gethsemane is at the base of the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. You can go and see this garden today. The term Gethsemane means oil press. Being at the base of the Mount of Olives and having olive trees in it, olives were crushed in a wooden olive press in this garden, out of which they would gather the oil for the purposes of cooking and using in lamps. And just as olives were pressed here, so this is where our Lord was pressed and crushed within His Spirit as He agonized in the hours leading up to the cross. When the Lord was in Jerusalem during His earthly ministry, He often went to this garden. Luke 21, 37 says that at night He abode and slept on the Mount of Olives. Since this was His normal course of action to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and sleep on the Mount of Olives, Judas knew where to find Christ when he led the soldiers to Him on the night of His betrayal. Knowing what Judas knew, Christ could have gone anywhere but the garden because that was the most obvious place where Judas would come to try and find him. But our Savior is not a cowering Savior, a hiding Savior, a running Savior, but a majestically courageous Savior who willingly came to this world to die out of infinite love for you and for me. Thus Christ went to the garden that night and made it very easy for Judas and the soldiers to find him and arrest him, because this was the appointed hour in which God had appointed that his son should die. I like John's account of the night in the garden when Judas and the band of men entered the garden with their lanterns, torches, and weapons. John 18, 4-6 reads, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then 
as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Our Savior knocked those guys to the ground by the power of his spoken word. He just said, I am. And the revelation of himself as the great I am was so overpowering that all these men immediately fell backward, including Judas. And this reminds us that the soldiers didn't take the Lord. He willingly went with them and willingly went to the cross. The soldiers could have left their weapons at home. He wasn't going to resist. He was going to the cross to die for our sins. Matthew 27, 57 to 60 reads, When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had honed out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Another confirmation for why you can trust the Bible is because there are numerous rolling stone tombs dating to the first century in and around Jerusalem. Some of them still have their circular rolling stones by their entrances. This is the type of tomb that our Lord was buried in. As Matthew 27, 60 tells us, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea laid the Lord's body in his own new tomb, which he had honed out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. This type of tomb, which was carved out of the rock, was for people of means and wealth. And Matthew 27, 57 tells us that Joseph was a rich man. It was a sacrifice for Joseph to give this tomb to the Lord. But, as we know, Christ only used that tomb for three days. Isaiah 53, 9 prophesied of the Messiah, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. The door to these rock tombs were typically made of a heavy, circular-shaped stone, which could only be moved by several strong men. This was done to ensure that no one would disturb the remains in the tomb. In these type of tombs, the body was laid after being wrapped in linen cloth with ointments and spices. And then customarily, the Jews left these bodies alone for a few years until they decayed down to the bones. Then the bones were placed in a small limestone box called an ossuary. And the ossuary remained in the tomb with the remains of other family members. And speaking of these ossuaries, a significant one was discovered not long ago in Jerusalem. Caiaphas was the high priest in Jerusalem from A.D. 18 to 36. He was the high priest in Jerusalem at the time of Christ. The Lord stood before Caiaphas at one of the late night sham trials before he was handed over to Pilate to be tried. In November 1990, about two miles south of Jerusalem, workers constructing a road in a park accidentally broke through a first century burial cave. When archaeologists examined the tomb, they found 12 bone boxes or ossuaries. One of the ossuaries held the bones of a 60-year-old male and was twice inscribed with the name of Caiaphas. It is a highly decorated, intricately carved ossuary. Most ossuaries are plain and contain no inscriptions, but the Caiaphas ossuary is ornately decorated, as would be the case for a high priest such as Caiaphas. This remarkable discovery provided the physical remains of an individual named in the Bible. John Crossan, a scholar who's critical of the Gospels, even had to acknowledge that Caiaphas's name and the names of the family interred with him make it clear that the small shaft tomb was the family resting place for the high priest Caiaphas, mentioned by name in Matthew 26 and John 18 for his role in the crucifixion. This is a direct link to the gospel stories of Jesus' execution. Luke 23, 33 reads, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, 
There they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. In 1968, in a Jewish neighborhood in northeast Jerusalem, building contractors unexpectedly uncovered an ancient burial site containing about 35 bodies. An 18-inch limestone ossuary, or bone box, was found at the site, in which were the bones of a man between 24 and 28 years old when he died. The box gave the man's name and had the Hebrew inscription, Yehu Hanan, the son of Hagkol. What was remarkable was that a seven inch iron nail remained in his heel bone, which showed that he had been crucified. Because of the value of iron and nails, and back at that time, typically the nail would have been reused for other crucifixions but the end of the nail was bent, making it difficult to remove, which probably explains why it was still in his heel. He had been crucified anywhere between AD 7 and AD 66. Fragments of olive wood were found at the point of the nail, revealing the wood of the cross on which he died. This was the first archeological discovery from Roman times of a crucifixion victim. Today, the bone box and heel bone is displayed in a gallery at the Israel Museum alongside other artifacts from the period of Roman rule in Judea. The Bible records that our Lord was crucified and they drove nails through His hands and through His feet. And this find is confirmation of Roman crucifixions in Jerusalem from the time of Christ. John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 read, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. I have so many favorite things in the Bible, I lose track of them all. And one of my favorite accounts in the Lord's earthly ministry is the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. For many years, the Pool of Bethesda was cited by critics as an example of the inaccuracy of the Bible because no such place had ever been found in Jerusalem. But those criticisms came to a sharp stop when the pool was discovered about 300 feet north of the Temple Mount. It had been buried under centuries of rubble. You have to look way down to see the pool. How far down it is shows how far the city of Jerusalem has been built and rebuilt on top of things from the past. Interestingly, along with the discovery of the pool, archaeological excavations discovered that just like the Bible says, the pool had five porches. These porches are referring to covered walkways with columns. There were four porches around surrounding the pool, one on each side, and a fifth one that cut through the middle. It's exactly as the Bible says, and just as John described it. Bethesda means house of mercy. And John 5, 4 teaches how God in His mercy toward Israel had an angel stir the water of the pool from time to time, and whoever was first into the water was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Thus, understandably, there was a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And this is why there are many hospitals named Bethesda, because of all the sick and infirm that were around it here. The Lord, in keeping the law, was in Jerusalem for a feast day, and He visited the pool of Bethesda. And I like to stop and picture that in my mind. Christ and His love and mercy, walking among the sick, the infirmed, and the hurting. He cared about every one of them. He still does care about those who are sick and hurting. That day, Christ, by His personal presence, made Bethesda a house of mercy. Christ saw a lame man at the pool who had been lame for 38 years, and he asked him, Wilt thou be made whole? That's a great question to ask to those who do not believe, who need the Savior, who need salvation from their sins. Do you want to be made whole? Today, Christ makes people 
whole spiritually by faith alone in his finished work. The lame man didn't understand that the Lord could make him whole. Instead, he began explaining that he didn't have anyone to help him get into the water first when the water was stirred. And your heart goes out to the poor guy as you read that. The great physician, Jesus Christ, then responded, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. Christ saw his need. He knew the depth of that need. And he took the initiative to meet that need. And that's the same with each one of us in our great need of salvation. And Christ, he met that need by his cross and resurrection. John chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 read, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. Like the pool of Bethesda, some critics of the Bible also said that there was never a pool of Siloam. The pool was discovered, however, during excavation work for a sewer in the autumn of 2004. The excavations also revealed that the pool was 225 feet wide on one side, that steps existed on at least three sides of the pool, and that the pool was in the shape of a trapezoid. A portion of the pool remains unexcavated. Structures and land owned around it in the modern-day city prevent archaeologists from digging out the entire pool. In John 9, the Lord healed a man blind from birth. The Lord spat on the ground and put the mud on this man's eyes and told him to walk to the pool of Siloam to wash it off. When the man arrived at this public pool, he stepped down into it, splashed the water on his face, wiped his eyes, and for the first time in his life, he was able to see. He could see everything he ever wondered about all his life. Everything was new. Everything was amazing. He saw everything clearly for the first time in his life. And that blind man is a picture of all mankind. Everyone born into this world is born blind, spiritually blind. The Lord Jesus Christ giving sight to this blind man is a picture of the Savior who is the light of the world, bringing the light of life into a person's soul when we trust Him. Like the healed blind man, now we are not in darkness. We're in the light. We once were blind, but now we see. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. 2 Kings 20, 20 reads, And the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, and all his might, and how he made a pool and a conduit, and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah was one of the kings of Judah, one of the greatest. He ruled for 29 years and was a good and godly king. 2 Kings 18, 5-6 says of him, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. In 2015, an archaeologist digging just south of the Temple Mount discovered a 2,700-year-old clay seal bearing King Hezekiah's name. In ancient times, a lump of soft clay would be used to seal documents. If a king was sending the document, he would press his signet ring into the clay. The clay seal that was found read, Belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. And this corresponds exactly with what the Bible says of Hezekiah. 2 Kings 18.1 reads, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. During his reign, anticipating an impending siege by the Assyrians led by King Sennacherib, King Hezekiah ordered a tunnel for water to be dug. The Gihon Spring was outside the city, and this confronted King Hezekiah with a double dilemma to First, to provide water for the besieged city, 
and second, to deny that source of water to the Assyrian army. Thus, Hezekiah had a water channel chiseled and carved out of the rock beneath the city, secretly diverting and channeling water from the Gihon Spring into the walled city of David, where people could safely collect water during the siege. Second Chronicles 32.30 reads, This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. In 1838, Hezekiah's tunnel was discovered. The tunnel winds through 1,750 feet of limestone bedrock. The pick marks of Hezekiah's workers are still visible on the rock walls and ceiling of the tunnel. And knee-high to waist-high water still flows through it, just like the purpose for which it was built 2,700 years ago. Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 to 7 reads, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Evidence for the existence of the temple in Jerusalem is abundant. There are ruins of storefronts from the time of Christ that were used for the selling of lambs and doves for sacrifice in the temple. From the area of those storefronts, you can look way up the high wall to see what has been considered the pinnacle of the temple mount. This area near and around the temple was a busy, bustling section of Jerusalem in the time of Christ. And from that high point in the temple is where trumpets were blown and announcements were made to the people below. And it is likely here where Satan took the Lord up into the holy city and setting him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. The devil quoted Psalm 91, 11 to 12, and used that scripture to tempt the Lord. And don't let it escape your notice that the devil used scripture. Even today, he uses it to tempt and deceive people. Satan tempted the Lord to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple into this busy courtyard of the temple, and then by the angels gathering him up in their arms so that he'd have a, a nice, soft landing, he would demonstrate to all that he was Israel's Messiah and the Son of God. Christ's response to the devil was, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. To have tested the Father in this way would have been to question the Father's love, not prove it. Christ came to do the Father's will, and that was not it. The Father's will was the cross. Christ would demonstrate beyond a doubt that he was the Messiah and the Son of God by his death and conquering death by his resurrection. In this area is a pile of huge boulders and limestone blocks that were used by Herod for the construction of the Temple Mount buildings. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD, however, they dismantled and destroyed the buildings on the Temple Mount, and they pushed these blocks off the mount to the street below. Near the Colosseum in Rome is the Arch of Titus. This is a 50-foot tall Roman triumphal arch built to honor Titus's victory over the Jews. Titus was the commander of the Roman soldiers who conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD. Inside the arch is a carving that depicts the Romans parading valuable items taken from the temple in Jerusalem through the streets of Rome. And the depiction includes the golden seven-branched lampstand, and the table of showbread that was in the temple. 
It further shows trumpets and other items from the temple being carried through Rome. On the southern side of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is the important find of the flight of steps that led up to the Temple Mount. These steps were there in the time of Christ. There is no doubt that Christ walked all around these area, this area and up those steps when he visited the temple. It's a powerful place to visit because you are truly walking in the footsteps of the Savior, the Creator, the very Son of God. And this is where Neil Armstrong felt overwhelmed to walk where Christ had walked. The arched entryways at the top of the steps are called the Huldah Gates. They were named after a prophetess who dwelt in Jerusalem during the reign of King Josiah. These gates are on the southern wall of the Temple Mount, and they gave entrance to the temple in Christ's day. But they were walled up during the Middle Ages. Also at the top of the steps, in a corner, another gate is visible which has been identified as a possible location of the beautiful gate. You can see a little bit of what's left of it. Over the centuries, the gate was closed and the wall, and a wall was built into it. It was called the beautiful gate for a reason. It was an ornate gate leading into the temple. Following the infilling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Peter healed a lame man in the power of the Spirit at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. As Peter and John were going into the temple, the lame man asked an alms of them. Peter responded, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Instantly, the lame man was made completely whole, and he proceeded to enter into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Peter healed the lame man in the name of Jesus Christ. Performing that miracle in Christ's name and authority gave witness to the Lord's power, life, and resurrection, and it confirmed his identity as the Messiah of Israel, which the gospel of the kingdom required of people to believe at that time in order to be saved. The ruins in Jerusalem give abundant proof that the temple stood in Jerusalem, and they also confirm the places and locations in the Bible, showing that in every way, you can trust the Bible. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.